Hi, I'm Patrick Palm, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to these interviews is that Favro clients are some of the most innovative and agile businesses out there. And it's used for collaborative planning by marketing teams, by product teams, HR, management teams. And what this means is that we get to know some truly inspiring people. So what we do in this podcast is that I invite them here for a conversation about something where they are true leaders. So we can all learn from it. Let's go. Thank you so much for uh, joining my little podcast. Yeah. Happy to be Thanks here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. This is a humbling experience because your podcast is one I'm listening to and you know, you're, you're awesome. So this is going to be one where I'm going to really try to say as little as possible uh, because I mean, I've, I've been on speaking with you before and it's kind of, it's interesting how, you know, you're, you're so gelled, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, you're, you're, you're an amazing, um, uh, you, know, you know, couple to listen to. Um, but that kind of leads me to my first question. So, you know, how did you, how do you get into game development? I mean, what's the, what's the whole story to, to the studio you're running? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's sort of a weird, way. yeah, it's a weird path. I think, uh, cause you know, I think as people will notice our, our last names are the same because we're brothers. So, uh, we got started basically from, uh, not really thinking we were going to be able ever to make games so much as kind of landing in the game space. And uh, that came from basically doing game jams uh, towards, in my case, towards the end of my uh, college days and did a game jam, which was like basically a 48 hour event where you build a video game over the course of a couple of days. Um, and up until that point, I had never thought that it was a thing that I could do sort of in a you know, broad context of like having the technical knowledge, the artistic capability, whatever. And then just happened to have done it over the course of two days in sort of a self-surprising way. Uh, and I passed that passed the tool I use, which was Game Maker, over to uh, our, our other brother, Seth, who does the game programming. And, uh, and he picked it up, started working on it. And then slowly but surely over the course of like a year or two, he and I uh, landed at a company together, worked there for a short period of time, and then broke off to uh, all three of us basically started Butterscotch, sort of as like a side project thing. Um, and the shenanigans, the name of the company is Butterscotch Shenanigans. So the shenanigans part was meant to sort of umbrella include anything that we might do. Um, and Adam was getting a PhD in molecular biology at the time. And so uh, he was off doing that cool thing. Seth and I started making games. Uh, and then we just kind of slowly ended up all managing to come together um, before the launch of Crashlands and all working together uh, once Adam got his PhD in molecular biology. So it was this weird kind of, I don't think any of us thought we were going to end up here, but we kind of happily have coalesced. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely way. not. I think I think Seth, uh, the third brother who's not here, um, I think he was the one whose dream, you know, was to go make video games for a living. Yes. Um, and just didn't think it was possible, you know. So he was he was finding himself kind of falling tangentially into you know trying to trying to come into come at games sideways, right? So he uh, had started a joint law and business program uh, to be a lawyer with the idea of being maybe I can like come into the industry, but like from the legal admin side. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that wasn't until just by, just by chance, I guess, yeah, because Sam, you it actually started that game jam started because you were working for some little startup. Uh, I was a marketing intern. Lewis and he's yeah, a marketing intern. A summer. You know? Yeah. And they were like, uh, we make game stuff, I guess. I don't think they really knew what they were doing. Um, but so, <laughs> so let's, uh, we need people to make some games or something. Is that a thing? You know? And so Sam was yep. like, yeah, I'll go figure that out, I guess. And, you know, spun up a game jam, Googled mm -hmm. around for how to make games, you know, up comes game maker from yo-yo games. And then that's like the, that sort of set down the, the whole trajectory. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes, roundaboutly, I guess is the short answer for. So <laughs> yeah. when was the first time, you know, you felt, you know, you felt, you know, like the taste of success. I mean, you know, big or small, you know, it doesn't have to be, mm. you know, sales or, or it's just that you felt like, okay, hmm, this, this, you know, this is working, you know, we, we, we just succeeded with this thing that definitely makes us feel confident in, in the trajectory of, you know, making mm. great games. I think for me, it was, uh, there, were, there were two key moments. One was after our, uh, I think it's going to be our second or third game jam together um, that Seth and I had done in St. Louis. We presented the game that we had made over the course of these, these two days to this ended up being a crowd about a hundred 
150 people. And everyone was just laughing there, just like just out of their gourds with like how ridiculous of a thing we had managed to make in just that two day period. Which and game? that was, was, that, that was Tal Fight, the Tal Fight of the Tal Gods, fight. the original. Yeah. yeah. So, and that was when we're like, I couldn't draw arms. And so the character's arms were replaced with bananas because they were like arm shaped, you know, like I, it was just, it was all over the place, but we, we just keep on going in a way that sort of, you sort of a, don't really worry too much about the places where you're super weak and you try to make the whole thing, make it whole, you know, as much as you can. And but, so that yeah, experience it originated, was awesome. Yeah. It originated the, we have, we have a lot of core strategies we've developed over time, but one of them was, you know, developed in that first game jam or one of the, that early game jam where uh, anytime we have a deficiency of some sort, whether it's, we don't know how to animate a thing, don't know how to draw the thing, whatever it is. We just find some way to use humor or explosions mm -hmm. to cover it. So that's <laughs> always, yep. always a, it's like, so when you, when you start that game, we start towel fight. Uh, the first thing that happens is you're just told you've been teleported to this arena and you now have bananas for arms. Right. And yep. so we just explain away the thing that we couldn't do at the time. And if you look at our earlier games too, like you'll see there's just like the, there's explosions constantly on everything and they're very fast. Like so mm -hmm. it's video games or, you, you know, you just barely even notice. Right. But behind that explosion though, is something we didn't want to do or didn't know how to do. Right? <laughs> Usually using it to mask sort of some uh, yeah. interesting technical problem that we didn't have to bother with, like transitioning things or whatever else. You just put an explosion on top of it and you're good to go. It's done. Yeah. Figured it out. You know, this um, makes me yeah, think, think about, um, uh, I have, have um, you know, a, a friend, you know, he, he said that, um, you know, if you're doing anything creative, you know, game, architecture, whatever, if you have entirely uh, no limits, uh, that might actually not be great uh, for creativity. Yes. And he said that, you know, one of the best friends of creativity is boundaries. Because if you have to mm -hmm. like relate to those boundaries, it, it forces you. And he said, sometimes those boundaries can simply be a budget, but it can also be other things. And, um, you know, when you think about production, you know, how do you build in, let's say, the, the, the right boundaries uh, to, to enhance creativity? Kind of, we, we had a, oh, yeah. another podcast. We, we I talked with Don Daglo about um, leading uh, uh, creatives. Um, oh, sorry, it was the one with Mark Kyle. And, uh, and we talked a lot about that. So, so my question is this. As you have progressed and become better and better, do you feel like you've almost lost something on the way? Because it sounds like you know those mm. boundaries you had there in the beginning. Well, the boundaries were the limitations, right? But it 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 made you do some you know really creative things and and you know cool you know design choices. So you know, do you feel like you lost something on the way as you become better and have a bigger team and you know those kind of things? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. This is because we're constantly fighting against uh, you know short-term get it done versus long-term do it well versus stay within constraints versus try to make a long runway so we don't have to worry about constraints, right? So that, and of course the dream running any business, um, but especially one that's chaotic and, and hard to survive as the games industry, the whole thing, the whole goal is to just kick out a runway so that you just, you just make whatever you want and you don't worry about it. Right. Um, so this is a, it's a constant, push and pull of should we accept this constraint and work around? Because of course, working around a constraint is itself a cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but then also in, in, our, in our case, since we are the team, then we control what the constraints are to an extent. Not the, not the money part, that just is what it is, right? Uh, but the, the shape of the game, where we're going to deploy it, all that kind of stuff. And so we have so much room for how to choose our constraints that that's always a thing we have to worry about. But I, I would say that, well, it's a worry we frequently have of like, are we taking too long? Are we mm -hmm. worried too much about hitting some bar or whatever? Right. Um, while we constantly have that worry, I think that I think we have it to kind of a healthy level where we use it as a, as a reminder to step back and just, think about what we're doing again as an, it's like an evaluate it's a reevaluation trigger you know um but i don't think practically speaking that this has felt like it's been a thing that has started to harm us if that yeah. makes sense I think, I, do. I think recently we've been focusing so much on like 
the developer experience and the quality of the stuff they're producing, like really focusing on the long-term experience that that was where those biggest questions came in of like, is this, is this good? Right. Cause it feels like nothing is happening, but we're starting to see a bunch of that stuff pay off right now. Like it's in start and we're seeing what that means on the other side. And it's really fantastic, you know? So yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a hard one. It's a really hard yeah, one. Yeah. I'll definitely say after, after the success of crash lands, I think we we flailed around quite a bit, I think in a, oh, in a weird way. Yeah. yeah. Because it basically the, you know, when we launched the game, we had, I think like maybe a month ish of money left in the bank. Um, you know, like it was not, it was very much a, like, oh, I guess that's that. I hope that goes. Yeah, and uh, and by money thing. left in the bank, it's important to also say that we were being supported by our spouses uh, and yeah. by our savings that we had built up that we were just burning. Right. So it wasn't like we didn't have a publisher. We didn't have like a bunch of cash to pay for development. We just had some amount of personal runway basically that we were just closing in on the end of. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think after that, when, when we hit this point where because of the success of that game, you know, we were able to think very long, like almost, we almost went from so short-term focused to being able to think in like a five-year term that I think it sort of like broke our minds for a short period of time. <laughs> so I couldn't, cause you're, you're still operating how you sort of survive or right? in that survival mode of like, well, we just need it this week. Like you need it tomorrow. Like just sort of get stuff done. Um, but then also pushing and trying to change your the way you feel about those constraints uh, or catch up to the reality of them. Uh, but then, like you said, not lose something, whatever that is, as far as like, if that's that the ability to actually get something out the door uh, because you are time limited. Um, and so I think it's, it's been, I think we're, we're in a very good spot now. I do think there was, there was a bit of a wandering period uh, in the sharp contrast from not really having much success and being sort of always at like a dead sprint to success that, you know, punted out a really long runway for us. And I think we did kind of flail around there a good deal <laughs> to say the least. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it was. So, it so was do, you, do you feel like you're out of period. that now? You have, you know, have you stabilized, so to say? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think since uh, probably since I would say mid 2018 or so. And a bunch of that came down to, I think, finally getting a grip on what production uh, looked like. Basically, what production was, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, I think we, we, had, we had a lot of very good or very sincere um, you know, dedication to good management and good production practices. Um, but I think we mistaked oftentimes what fell into a management problem versus what fell into a production problem because they oftentimes the symptoms of them kind of can swap between the two categories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it was just the, it was a, a learning period of, of maybe two years or so uh, of kind of figuring out what was really going on. And I think once we got a grip, uh, got into DevOps, um, you know, our last game level head, the launch of that thing was so weird compared to Crashlands. Crashlands we launched and it were, you know, the whole studio was on fire for like eight weeks afterwards. It was the best time and the worst time. Man, you know? It was brutal. I mean, it was success finally, but oh, we barely survived those. At what cost? Those, yeah. few, those yeah. few months after that. Uh, yeah. And then we launched Levelhead uh, in 2020 in May. And uh, you know, we launched on a Thursday and we told everyone like, oh, you know, just prepare. Like the weekend might be crazy. Um, and we had like a, a lot of players for those, you know, in that first weekend, but no crashes. The game was launched on six platforms simultaneously. Everything was just like, and everybody just we had a normal weekend it was the weirdest thing yeah we had because uh, we launched it on a compared Thursday. to the trauma yeah yeah because yeah, yeah it starts rolling out it was like wednesday midnight or something you know it's rolling out for mm -hmm. 12 hours basically across all the platforms all the regions um yeah we had seven separate builds we're supporting 12 languages it's an it's a game with an online component where we're a cross-platform online component where we're not doing real-time multiplayer which is a whole other difficult thing mm -hmm. right but we still had to you know sync player data across and in, in, in the game, people make levels and share them with each other to play, right? And the computer leaderboards and all that stuff. And so all of that stuff had to work, right? And and then it just did, just all just all of it. Like the, the launches were fine, like it, it appeared everywhere. Um, the server side stuff was running. We had a few little hiccups, but they weren't even emergencies, you know? So given the scale- it's weird. Of of the launch it was it was just nothing compared to like so the chill. relative scale of crash lands and then like how painful that was <laughs> shortly after yeah. so yeah I'd, I'd say we've definitely stabilized uh especially in the last couple of years here yeah well even so, compared so to that, that was already two years ago 
I was, yeah, yeah, that was already two years ago now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, the title of um, our talk today is, you know, from from indie to you know games business, and it it sounds, you know, from your story, it's almost like it is almost like a, a you know a story so far with you know three chapters. You know, it's that first chapter of uh, you know you know founding a company, you know, struggling, you know, not much money left in the bank, and taking from what you were saying, it was maybe not even money in the in the bank account of the company was really like maximizing credit cards and you know those kind of things so it, it's really that kind of you know entrepreneur's journey you know mm-hmm. um and then it seems like there's a second phase uh, of about two years if i understand you right um where you're kind of going from that first success uh just the, the, there are things that are a bit chaotic there and then this is like three, third chapter you're in now where you kind of find your way on okay so you know how do how we do you know run an efficient business? Um, so do you agree with with my kind of breakdown of those chapters? You know, if we're making a movie about you guys, w- would this be kind of a, the right way to structure it? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean that it's it sort of has that it has that really nice kind of three act structure built in conveniently. I think at the time of yeah. this uh, podcast, but like you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know exactly what act four is like, but I feel much more confident about whatever's going to happen there than I certainly did during <laughs> two when we were flailing around. A lot. Well, you, you know, the kind chapter of four, that's too. the sequel. So that's the next movie. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it actually feels like we're at the start of the sequel right now. Like, uh-huh. like we finished those, yeah. those three acts week. Cause then we, at the, you know, the culmination of this, of for, you know, get, getting into this almost randomly at the end of the industry. And then, uh, and, and we had, you know, we're very strategic about it, but strategy doesn't actually align with what happens, right? It's just, mm-hmm. we just, we just had a thing we were trying to do that was very mm-hmm. clear. And, and then we know we adapted and we strategized and we learned and we tried stuff. And uh, as we went, um, like we saw the culmination of that, like you're saying, right? We said, and then finally it works or it seems to, and then it's a crisis and we don't know what to do. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, at the kind of end of all of that, at the aftermath of that, we start to kind of rebuild and then we launch level head. And like Sam said, s- smooth sailing. It was beautiful. And, and that's not to say it wasn't a lot of work, you know, getting to that point, but we really focused on trying to make sure that the work life balance was good, that we were able to make frequent builds that we had lots of QA going on and like all that stuff and building that was really hard mm-hmm. um, and learning how to do it was really hard, but we, that was what that time was. And the culmination of it was then this just silky smooth launch. And so now after that, we're now working on our next title. And that's now with all of this context of like mm-hmm. seeing just how much it mattered to, to really focus on tooling and processes and, and our, our moment to moment experience doing the work. Uh, then we're going just all in on that now with, with her next title and so i think it feels like it's the it's that start of that next thing of like you know let's like crash and then we get up to the point it's like oh hey here's like here's the release we celebrate right and now we're kind of like back at the not bottom like in a bad sense but just like there's a roller coaster ride you know we're like we're down here now it's chill it's quiet (laughs) everything's fine we got we we got time we like what we're doing we're making some cool stuff uh but we have no idea what is coming, you know? And so, yeah, I think, mm-hmm. I think we're in the sequel now, actually. So before we get too far into the sequel, um, I think, I think, you know, many are listening to this, um, you know, are indies and, and not all, but, uh, you know, some, you know, that I met, you know, there's sometimes a little bit of this um, thought that if we just make that success, you know, all our problems are gone, mm. but it sounded, you know, if I go, if we go back here to, let's say, you know, chapter two and three, it seems like, well, you kind of get a whole, you know, new set of problems here in chapter two. And then chapter three was a little bit, okay, you had to figure those out. So um, could you, can we do a bit of a, let's say, a compare and contrast between like mm-hmm. chapter two and chapter three? You know, like, the, you know, the thing that, okay, you had your, you had this success, um, you know, you're taking things to the next level, uh, but you had things to figure out. And what did that look look like in those, you know, that two year chapter two, uh, compared to you know how how you you know the, the result when you had to figure it out because I think I think it would be very valuable for everyone listening and kind of you know what were the issues that you had then and and how did you solve it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think 
Uh, I mean, a lot of it comes down to, I think, when you're in, when you're a very small team. So again, our team is only uh, still like you know, basically six, seven people. Um, and then with uh, about the same size squad doing kind of part-time and QA stuff. So it's a very small team. And uh, I think one thing that's really common when you're in that kind of space uh, and you and you do manage to hit a point of success, you have this inflection point, um, is that there's going to be a moment where, while it's the case that you've done everything right, uh, having success is its own crisis because you haven't, unless you've already been in a successful position before that, you actually don't have the systems or the infrastructure in place to handle what being quote unquote successful means, right? Um, really what it means is, is being able to, how do you simultaneously now uh, do both the creative and the forward-looking work of any new projects, new content for your games, uh, any new tooling build-outs, whatever, while simultaneously supporting what it was that are, allowed you to like do this next piece. And I think that like negotiating that boundary between uh, how you set up your studio, how you set up your workflows, whatever else, such that you can actually preserve the time of the of the basically the creative or the product teams to create new stuff uh, when the team is so small and you're handling all this inbound material from having a success it was one of those really big ones. And so, you know, I think uh, people, like, you know, we did, I know there were a bunch of studios uh, around the time who we also talked to. One of the things people told us, they're like, be really careful when you, if, like, be really careful about hiring and growing. Um, because if you do it, like, if you do it wrong, it, you know, it's really challenging to figure out even what's kind of happening. And I think we, we saw that we were just drowning in the, the kind of change in the nature of the work. We didn't seem like we could make a lot of forward progress on the, that new value add to either just the existing game or even a new game. So we started bringing people on because it was like, oh, we just don't have the bandwidth, right? Um, I think what we really had was production problems, you know, like unidentified production problems kind of across the board. That meant yeah, that we had as we process added more people, problems that we interpreted as people problems, yeah, or that we thought we could solve by by hiring uh, people to like fill a slot, right? And so, what ended up happening, as with any production system that isn't properly optimized for uh, truly for like actually working at scale, then as you add more people, it's not the case that you uh, even get sometimes marginal benefit out of that. You actually sometimes, in our case. Um, you know, we ended up managing, like doing all the managing work, trying to lead the studio as well as sort of manage the previous game um, and sort of slowed down, actually. The whole the whole thing just got bigger. It was like bloat, I guess, maybe is what you refer to it as. But like it got bigger, it just cost more, and it did less overall. Um, and so it was just really hard one lesson of being like, oh, okay, you know, less, less is more, truly, when it comes to, um, I think, the scale of a team. And in particular, you have to know, you have to actually know what it is that is going sideways or like where actually the bottlenecks are located to be able to effectively grow a team or something like that. And so I think the way that looks different now is, I mean, we do, you know, we, we have successfully hired, you know, uh, additional people since, since our early kind of uh, attempt at growth and then having to contract and, a lot of that, I think, comes down to being able to actually see where it is that we need more power and then being able to effectively communicate and shape that role to fit as opposed to, I think, just kind of guessing or hoping that it's like, I think it's this thing, uh, and then trying to plug it in and then being like, oh, no, uh, kind of went sideways. So very challenging. Yeah. I mean, I think the, I mean, the core lesson from that first round was that everything is a workflow problem. It's not, Yes. it's a workflow problem first. And if, if you don't have that tightened down really well, then, because every solution is also problems, right? Because it's like a feature. Like if you make a feature, you've also made bugs. It's the same mm -hmm. idea, right? And so the more stuff you do, the more people you hire, the more, uh, you know, the more products you make, the more whatever. It's just like when we, you know, we launched a game, all of a sudden now we do customer support. Right. So like, yeah, like that's, that's good that we have to, right. But also we have to though. And so we have to kind of figure that out. And when we hire people well, now we have to manage people, but what does that even mean? Well, you know, it depends on what you're doing in the people. Right. But even just things like the communication channel complexity, right. Of mm -hmm. adding, you know, where there were three of us when we started, we hired three people right after crash lands. And we took what was, you know, communication between three people, which is, 
six possible groups communicating, right? If I did that math right. <laughs> and then you, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a combinatorial thing. Sometimes you divide by two. I can't remember. It's fine. Uh, the point is, it's combinatorial explosions are what you get. You just add one more thing and also the numbers go way up, right? And so you add six people. And now it's that little six times five times four times. Like the, the number of combinations of people uh, who are trying to communicate with each other. And it just goes up so high. That's one of those things that's really hard to appreciate is like adding a person when you only have a few is the, there isn't a small incremental incremental cost there. It's actually enormous. And so yeah. the gain has to also be really huge, but it can't be if it's in the context of bad systems like we had, right? Because we, and, and I think a lot of what we had confused without realizing it was what we were doing because of versus despite it, right? So, because mm -hmm. It's, it's the idea of constraints like we talked about earlier, right? Because like a constraint can be a thing that you succeed because of, but it can also be a thing you succeed despite, right? And it's actually not possible to know for sure you know, which, which one was. of those categories it's in. And I think that's a lot of what we were dealing with was we just didn't realize how much we just had bad systems because we could get away with it. With three people, we grew up together, yep. we can... We, and we were each doing our own thing, but we all had a really good saw picture of like what the studio's up to, right? Because we're running it. And we're fully aligned on goals the whole time. So we don't have to worry about making sure that that's being communicated effectively to other people. Just like everything is actually really easy, you know, in that context. And so because of all of that, we were able to get where we were, despite having just... Yeah non-existent i think is the most accurate way to describe our processes right <laughs> and even though like we thought we were doing things well and, and i think you know talking to other other indie teams at the time too like we thought about it a lot more than other people a lot of other people did but you still only know as much as you know right and so you have to have those experiences to find out so i think that's a lot of it and I, I, at, at the end of all of that like the huge the core lesson we have as a as a team now like our kind of one of our driving philosophies is besides try to not do stuff whenever possible because doing stuff always has a high, has a high cost uh, is to try to create scalability as in the literal ability to scale which is a process problem but without actually scaling if that mm -hmm. makes sense right because scalability comes from good processes right it comes from uh, the ability to adapt to having more people more systems more robots more whatever um and so you want that because that means that everybody's moment to moment work is better and more effective and more fun. But then if you also scale, well, now you've just caught back up and now everything's hard and not very fun again. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you have more problems and now all those need more solutions and so on. So our, we're, we're trying to really stay just as small as we think we can get away with. Um, yeah. That was kind of the big, that's really the big lesson I think from all of that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something on that. Um, so, if you would you, if you would go back to you know what we call chapter one here, you know just when you got started, and and you would do this all again, would you, would you have and, and, and you know everything you know today, would you have put let's say a little bit more uh, process, you know, probably very lightweight, but but still you know in place, um, and that would have achieved some of that kind of scalability you're talking about uh, at, mm -hmm. at an even earlier stage i mean i think i think i would like to say yes i mean if, if this is one of those things where i think if, you, if i was given the same constraints as we had then which you know seth and i launched two games in six months uh on on mobile because we didn't we were like we need to have some revenue coming in that was how much money we had initially and for as far as savings so if i had you know if i had six months basically of money and we were restarting this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would have enough. I would have ju just enough processes in place to facilitate the making of stuff and this and and uh, what happens when you launch the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the truth is that you know that early on, you you're so consumed. I think this is you know we talk about the difference between like being in, focusing on being the an indie versus a games business part. I think kind of does come in down to this in a way, which is. The difference between focusing so purely on the game and the game experience versus basically having a broader, a broader eye toward not just the game, not just the design of the game, but the design of your studio, 
the design and structure of the tools that your studio and team uses, uh, and then how that actually fits into this broader launch uh, and development pattern. And I think once you get there, I think it's, it is, it feels to me like it's, it's so much, it's less focused just on, just on like the, the experience of the game that you're trying to craft and more so on uh, almost like the whole, the group who is doing the work um, and making that experience the focus where it's like, how do we make it such that this whole thing uh, just sings and everyone's having a really good time the whole time, including after launch like that. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard. I, if it was just the three of us again, sort of starting over. I mean, we, I don't think there's any way to escape that we would have a lot of processes in place by default. Now <laughs> like we have, yeah, yeah, we're very process and production oriented. This oh, yeah. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't go back to those days, you know, for anything. If I, if I could help it, it was very painful. Uh, a lot harder. Yeah. I think, I would think an important piece of all this though is is the role that luck plays in all of it, right? Yeah. Because it's it's one of those things that's like it's I also would like to say, yeah, like learning all the stuff that we've learned, I would like to be able to go back and like if we now had all that stuff and started over, man, just could crush it. Cause like we did it even without that, you know, like we could crush it, right? Uh, I think the reality is is that we stumbled in blindly, you know, into into yeah. accidents here and there that that paid off. And like, and as a, as a studio, we almost ran out of money a few times, um, at least twice that one we already mentioned and then another time later. Um, and maybe actually three times. Yeah. Cause also before level mm-hmm. launch, we were running low too. Right. Um, but then each time there was like, there was some piece, there was just some piece of, of the process that was basically random, you know, that we couldn't like, yes, we set ourselves up to, make it so that that kind of a thing could happen, but we couldn't control that it did or what the outcome was. And if we were to go back and just start rolling dice again, you know, because yeah, the fact is without, the, without those things, without those randoms, you know, those random things that we didn't control, we already would, we wouldn't be here now in running this company. Mm-hmm. Right. And those are things that with more knowledge, we could have prepared ourselves for even better just rolling the dice again you know like and i and i wouldn't gamble on taking that knowledge that we have back <laughs> to then re-roll the dice because so much of, of the success uh i mean in any industry but in particular in the entrepreneurial and then games space just it just is random you know because like because the way also that games launch it's it's a one done deal right you spend years developing it millions of dollars especially as you scale up this this the scope of the game and how many people are involved huge amount of investment and then there's a launch day right there's just a day when the game comes out and you cross your fingers what if you cross your fingers right <laughs> what if what if some other what if you know the next skyrim launches on that day or elden ring launches on that day right or whatever and uh and or, you know, it's during some event or some, you know, like so many things can happen that just take that one moment in time and just throw a wrench. But the bigger thing I think is that this industry changes fast. And so over the few years it takes to build your game, the possible business deals you can do are changing dynamically the whole time where you might be able to even sell your game successfully. Cause each platform over the years that we've been doing this, which is what, 10 now, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, have changed dramatically. Like when we first started, you wouldn't go to Xbox for indie stuff. Actually, you would for like for the first year, kind of we were in business or whatever. And then all of a sudden, they were just like, no indies, basically. We're not going to support anybody, right? And then now they're back, and like, and you can be successful there if you're in Game Pass, right? Which conceptually didn't exist, you know, as a, like subscription services weren't a thing. It's so like this is all changing so fast, and you have that, you have that, you start making a game, and then two plus years later. You're like, well, I hope the market is what we designed this game for, <laughs> you know, two years ago when we yep. started and that the business contacts we have are still the same people. So we can actually clear, you know, clear a spot and get this thing launched and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, we're very lucky. We've worked very hard, but we're also very lucky. And, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I don't. I just, I really don't, I honestly don't think we could go back and just start rolling dice again. And but, but the, this, is a, this is the fun part also, company. right? I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. so much fun to be in an industry where, you know, the whole industry changes so much because it still yeah. feels like 
you know, you're in the frontier of something. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. You know, I was, I was discussing the other week when I was in LA with someone who spent a lot of time in film and we kind of got into this conversation why there's so much, um, you know, money and talent going into games now. Well, I mean, it's always been like that, but mm. even more now, you know? Right. And, and, and uh, you know, one part is simply business that, you know, when we look at what are people consuming as entertainment, games are taking us to bigger, you know, uh, piece of the pie. But there's, there's also, uh, you know, creative people are attracted to places where you can express, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and um, you know, there are other creative industries where things are for sure more stale. And, 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 you know, this industry is, is probably one, you know, maybe probably the best to be right now. Um, so, so there's, there's a lot around that. By the way, I really liked what you said around, um, yes, you would like to have a bit more, um, let's say, lightweight, but process in place, you know, you know, those super early days. Mm-hmm. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, which is in our expert team at Fevro, and, and we were discussing to create a template um for basically an indie studio like okay if you would mm-hmm. have like a template for like as 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 lightweight process as possible but but not lighter uh you know right. what would that look like uh because you know when i was running my previous company handsoft i, I gave a speech once at the at the developer conference uh f- you know, specifically for indies which is, was basically um you know i i, I took a little bit of, of a video clip from that movie in the game it, it's very old now mm-hmm. but there's this scene you know with this programmer you know he has this like things on post-it notes and he suddenly he lost the post-it note and that was like the problem i mean the guy is a great programmer <laughs> but suddenly you know he's like so stressed it's like total crunch and now he has now he has, has a mental breakdown because he lost the post-it note you know mm-hmm. um and i was really you know that was my inspiration for that that speech i was like well Look, here's like a super simple process you can use. So at least you get some kind of a uh, system around how you develop your assets and, and your features. You know, even if you just free people, you know, when you're working from your bedrooms, mm-hmm. you know, this is how, how we can just make your life a little bit easier. So we thought, okay, what's the 2022 version of this, uh, you know, in, in, in favor? Um, so, so it's encouraging that you say that. Um, I, have a, I have a final question. Uh, we're getting up on time, but um, when... Um, you know, when you start to really think more about this as, as a business, I, I guess we're in chapter three here now. Um, there's a couple of other things like, um, you know, IP, you know, registration, you know, those kind of things. Uh, did, did you also have those kind of things coming into, mm. you know, how you th- or did you have that from the beginning or, or maybe haven't even haven't thought about it? Or can you just give a little bit of perspective on those kind of, you know, questions that are normally you know that's the legal department at the big studio you know yeah, but yeah. you know when right. you're when you're small i mean when do you start thinking about those i mean what was your take on that yeah i think i think it sort of speaks to uh one of our core advantages and reasons that we still exist today as a studio is the diversity of backgrounds by which we all came into the space um and in our interests so that when it came to the business stuff so like so like, uh, like we mentioned earlier our brother seth uh his undergrad degree was in economics and finance or something. And then he got, he's a certified financial analyst because he studied and like, I don't know, there was like this huge tome of books that he had to like do. And I don't know. I, it's, it's basically the, a person who evaluates businesses and it's like, here's how much you should spend on it or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. So like he did that and he started his uh, law, his joint law business program. And, and so he's always been really into that stuff and then and studied it a lot. Um, and then I came to this from, academic science where one of the weird things you get exposed to is in in the biological sciences is the intellectual property aspect of which i'm not going to get like really into because i could just go as as sam can attest Uh, (laughs) but like it's uh it doesn't work the way you would think at least in the united states as a tax-paying citizen you know funding that that stuff uh and and so yeah it's just uh oh my train of thought here I mean, we have enough. We have enough. Oh, yeah, the IP stuff yeah. spread across. Yeah, that basically when it came to the yeah. IP things, we I think we were lucky enough to to recognize that you don't need to do it before you need to do it, sort of a thing. Where a lot of people will, uh, I've seen some, some studios or whatever else, you know, uh, spending a lot of money to because all the legal stuff costs a lot. Like all that protective stuff costs a lot, um, and they'll spend a lot of money on that before anything has happened. 
before you, they've even before they have anything that even is worth protecting. <laughs> and yeah, so well, it doesn't be questions. too early or too late, right? It's always yeah. 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 So we did we did it uh, with questions. We did it, I think just a just a trademark thing. Uh, it was after launch considerably, um, and you know it's kind of one of those like I think I think there's there's a lot of concern around. Um, like just how much of legal protection you need in place. I think largely you just need like, you just need bare bones stuff until you have something worth defending more or less. And you want to, you want to have enough of a setup that you don't have to like, you know, scramble and build everything from scratch at that point. But I'd say keep that very light. Cause that, that can, I mean, just the admin side of that alone costs a lot of money yeah. and well, I think can, it's, can really weigh you down. Yeah. I think it's for, and for, for us, it was that combo of like being, being, interested in, in knowing about it. So like, so in my case coming from, from the biosciences, just intellectual property law was just front and center all the time. So mm-hmm. I just, I read about it a lot, studied it um, in that context. Uh, and, and then again, Seth is also related to this stuff. Right. And so like at minimum we were, it was just something we were always aware of so that we would be constantly asking the question, like, what is our exposure here? Right. Do we, mm-hmm. do we need to be doing something? And at the same point, it's, it was, just trying to find that combination of what's the lightest weight thing we can do and not put the you know, cart before the horse, but also keep ourselves relatively safe. And I think the, what I would say is that the thing that people spend likely overemphasize is going to be intellectual property. Um, yes. Cause like, at least in like, in like, there's a lot of international stuff and it gets kind of murky, but, um, but when it comes to the, the concept of copyright and like the United States version is not too dissimilar from, everywhere else yeah I think you, you get so to... much protection just out of the gate just by doing the work right yeah that you can get away for a lot of intellectual property stuff you can kind of just get away with it um which obviously this isn't legal advice <laughs> but you can kind of get away with it and uh but the thing you cannot get away with is contract law that's where yes. that's where absolutely especially in the indie space or really anybody who's like i'm not a business person right but then they are running a business uh, the co- contracts are what, what will kill you. Um, and, yep. and, uh, and that, that's the place where we were lucky given our backgrounds um, that we knew that that was true. Um, and I think, and we, and it's a recurring thing we saw in the earlier days when we spent more time, just like in the indie community, kind of like talking to other people, there other people who were starting companies. Um, and the recurring theme was people get together, like, cool, let's make games right for, for a living. They start doing it. Uh, they, there's no explicit. Here's there's no legal structure. What there's yeah, no there's legal no, structure. There's no. It's basically a setup here. for like absolute chaos downstream. And yeah. so yeah, get that stuff buttoned up. And then when you're doing business to business things with platforms, publishers, whatever else, do not mess Don't around. Skimp on it. Yeah, yeah do not. If mess I around. had to, if I had only like, if I had to choose what to spend my legal budget on, I can only choose a mm-hmm. thing: contract like contract Absolutely. review and that sort of thing. I wouldn't spend a dime on the IP part. Yeah, it be, and it would be first. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be first on setting up your business before, before there's any chance you're going to see a dime from people giving you money for whatever you're doing. Uh, you need to already have explicit, explicit agreement amongst the founders or the, or mm-hmm. whoever, right. About who owns what and what does that mean? And what happens under all the various scenarios where somebody decides to leave or we want somebody to leave or whatever. Right. And we like, we're, you know, we're three brothers and we've had this the whole time, you know, like not a very good one in the beginning. We did a much better, more legally tight one more recently, but even still, like we had to go ask some, you know, kind of unfun questions. Like what happens if one of us dies or just becomes what happens really I'm unhandleable. Like, I'm you know? over this. I want to go yeah. live in the woods. You know, yeah. Or just wants to leave. Yeah. Like what yeah. we need to know what's going to happen. Right. And so much of contract law is exactly that. It's just, making everything explicit so that we all could all agree. Uh, and so I think that's the, so that, that coming into making a business is the, the fundamental because like, cause that's one of those things at the moment, because most things fail, right? So most people don't have to worry about the fact that they didn't have a plan and things weren't explicit. Uh, although it would have helped had things been more explicit, just reduce the likelihood of failure. Uh, but then the moment success starts to happen, that's when the fact that you didn't have that starts to become a real problem and like you hear that story you know just all the time Uh, but but also so if you make it that far right and as sam said you're making contracts with other businesses other people uh again that's where like some of the contracts that we've seen come across 
our way if we if we just sign them as is. Uh, whew, oh man, I would we would be sitting in a rough spot today. Uh, <laughs> and and we've we've had a few business deals that we just rejected outright because we couldn't come to an agreement where that where mm-hmm. we could get the contract to feel good, you know, um, and be reasonable um, on our side. And uh, and we spend like just an enormous amount of our time reading contracts um, yep. and redlining and sending it back and being like, just take this out, take this out, you know, like that that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we also have lawyers to do that for us, and we. Yeah, that's what I reckon. The moment we're like, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, the moment we're like, this is too legalese. We don't want to try to read this with normal person brains, you know. Then just have we just it's, it's the it's like the core thing we don't skimp on is is a contract <laughs> legal protection. So cool. yeah, I, th- I think that's very. Um, I think that's you know good 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 advice. I think this whole talk has almost been um, um, a, a class in you know how you build a studio. Um, maybe. Maybe we should uh, use this as a script and also create that show um, competing with um, Mythic Quest. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think there's for sure, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be, you know, in the game too. Um, and we for basically sure. name it this, you know, like, you know, from indie to, to games business. Um, <laughs> and it's, a, it's more of a, it's, it's, a, it's a happier story. And, and, mm. and I, you know, we didn't, um, you know, you were asking me, you know, before we started this, if, uh, if, it's, if it's okay with, you know, profanity, and we didn't have much of that. So I think in, in the final <laughs> script, you know, we, we're going to, we're going to, if there's no natural source of that that we could put into the script, Just we definitely check. have to invent some of that to yeah, spice yeah. up oh, the yeah. story, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but this has been really great. Um, I so hope to um, get another, um, you know, talk with you. Um, you know, we're, we're up today. Um, you know, thank you so much for, for joining this. Um, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks so much. much. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I certainly did. If you want to elevate yourself as a modern leader and help your teams become even more successful, then check out Favor Academy at favor.com. They will find podcasts, webinars, articles, all free of charge. Check it out.